refer to our wonderful Catherine Haller. Uh, Catherine has been for a long time involved in machine learning and computational neuroscience, and Catherine uh, is now at Google Brain, and she will tell you more about ethical frameworks in the neuroscience, cognitive science, and computer science communities. Hey, um, how's it going? Um, okay, so the panel today, or the fireside chat today, is on ethical frameworks in the neuroscience, cognitive science, and computer science community, communities. Um, uh, AI ethics is increasingly important in everything that we do. Um, we have responsible AI groups and organizations kind of popping up all over the place in industry as it relates to AI for sure. Um, I'm part of the responsible AI organization at Google, um, and I'm sure you'll hear more about different people and their backgrounds and the incorporation of responsible AI and AI ethics into, um, or ethics in general, into everything that we do. Um, and um, I'm looking forward to talking with you all today. Um, so today you are going to have two amazing speakers. Um, the first speaker is Joseph Finns. Um, Joseph is the E. William Davis Jr. Professor of Medical Ethics and Chief of the Division of Medical Ethics at Wheel Cornell Medical College. Um, he thinks about clinical pragmatism as a method of moral problem solving for medicine in a number of areas, including ethical and policy issues in brain injury and disorders of consciousness, uh, civil and disability rights for individuals with severe brain injury, palliative care, and research ethics um, in neurology and psychiatry. Um, he's a world leader in medical ethics and served as president of the International Neuroethics Society, past president of the American Society for Bioethics and Humanities, and a member of the board of trustees of the Hastings Center. Our, spec our second speaker is Francesca Rossi. Um, Francesca is an IBM fellow and AI ethics global leader and works um, at the TJ Watson IBM Research Lab in New York. Her research interests focus on AI, including constraint reasoning, uh, preferences, multi-agent systems, computational social choice, and collective decision making. She's the thought leader on the rapidly growing field of AI ethics. She is the in oh, sorry, she's the current president of Triple AI and fellow of the European Triple AI. Uh, she's been president of IJCI, um, that's the International Joint Conference on AI. And she's a member of the Science Advisory Board of the Future of Life Institute and a deputy director of the Leverholm Center for the Future of Intelligence. It's a lot of, it's a lot of, it's a lot of things these people have accomplished. Um, okay, so um, the overall structure of um, our, our meeting today is going to be that you're gonna hear uh, two talks from, from them. Um, they're about 25 minutes each, um, and then we'll have about 50 minutes of discussions. Discussion. Um, uh, the first 20 minutes will be me asking questions, um, and the last half hour, or maybe even a little more, will be them taking questions from you all, from the audience. Um, and so um, if you guys can think about questions that are pertinent to everybody and that people are interested in generally, I'd really appreciate it. I'll also ask you to um, hold all questions until we get to the discussion section section of the of this of the session discussion section of the session um, okay um, Joseph thanks Well, thank you so much for that introduction. It's really good to be here. <clears throat> you know, it's it, coming to a meeting like this and getting asked to talk about ethics would be like one of you getting asked to talk about math. <laughs> you know, like where do you start? 
And um, so I want to start um, by, by talking about um, ethical, neuroethical intelligence, artificial and otherwise. Um, I think we're lacking in intelligence in general, right? So artificial is, 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 is a bonus thing. But if you think about your daily interactions um, and how we interact with each other and politics and society, you realize that humans aren't particularly intelligent in ways that sometimes really matter. Um, and, and everything that we do vis-a-vis -vis AI has inputs from humans. Um, you know, we write the algorithms, we, we structure those, those uh, frameworks. So we have to think about how we think intelligently uh, and, and, and how, how machines do that for us as well. So it's all related. So um, sometimes when people say, I want artificial intelligence. How about just a little intelligence in general? So what I want to talk about today is specifically the relationship between neuroethics and computational uh, neuroscience and AI. And it's a conversation that's really long overdue, maybe dating back to 2001, which was, that's Hal, by the way, for those of you who too, are too young to remember him. Um, and he was, you know, IBM HAL, right? That was the the predecessor. So, um, so we have really a silo problem. Um, we were just talking about some of the people who, who sort of bridge the gap between neuroscience and, and AI and computational neuroscience. And, and there, there are some really notable people uh, like Wendell Wallach and others, but they're, they're, they're very few. And so I think we all need to be cross-trained and bilingual in these, in these areas. Um, I think the convergence is necessary. Um, what we do in neuroscience um, and, and what you guys do in computational work, um, are there's some common roots. Uh, computational neuroscience is central to neuroimaging, which has really been central to, the, to the, really the growth of neuroscience in the last 20, 25 years. Um, and so they're natural synergisms. Um, both relate to, to private and, and extended minds. By, by private minds, I mean what we can do for individuals vis-a-vis you know, BCI, brain-computer interfaces, uh, the, the, the clinical applications, but also extended minds. And I think AI can be thought of uh, in, in the public health arena as something that affects communities and how we interact with each other, um, you know, and, and how, you know, your phone can tell you, you know, where you want to go to dinner based on your prior activities. And all of us are, are contributing to that, to that database. Um, I think the futures of of neuroscience and, and neuroethics and, and, and AI are, are admixed um, in the context of, of ethical issues and regulatory issues. And some of the forces that are going to regulate what we do, vis-a-vis the mind, is going, to, is going to adhere to how we regulate AI and, and the computational work. And, and I want to talk specifically uh, about rights in my talk as a framework. I mean, I, that we could talk about, you know, specific, you know, criteria or guidelines for the ethical conduct of the work that we do, but I want to talk about a broad framework and have you think about three ideas, negative and positive rights and, and, and capabilities, all right? And I think that, that there's a cautionary note here um, about the ap apocalyptic view of AI, like it's going to end the world, it's going to change humankind as we know it, and it's all going to be bad. And the regulators who know very little about what, what we do in neuroscience and what you guys do in the AI world are going to, to write negative prohibitions. And I want you to leave here with the idea that rights have to be in balance. There need to be negative rights and positive rights. It's not just the things you can't do, but the things that you can do for the good of humanity um, by fostering positive rights. And that gets us to um, what's called the capabilities approach, um, as advanced by Amartya Sen, who won the Nobel Prize for, for economics, and the great philosopher Martha Nussbaum. So that's the precy of what we're going to talk about. So there's this, this um, Oxford Handbook of Neuroethics, and I got to write the epilogue in the, in the, in the book. And, 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 and in talking about it, I wrote, if there's a unifying theme to neuroethics in this anthology, it's the predominance of technology. Neuroethics is both made necessary by technology and utterly dependent upon it. Without resort to hyperbole, it could be asserted that neuroethics is essentially an ethics of technology. And that's true for AI and computational neuroscience. It's all about the problems that technology exposes and creates 
and the problems that technology resolves. And I want to specifically talk about an example that has, has been the focus of my work over the last 25 years. I know I look a lot younger. Um, and that's, that's a joke, okay? So I know it's early, you're decaffeinated still. And that's the issue of how technology with computational neuroscience has revealed the problem of covert consciousness, okay? And that's, 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 that's people who appear to be unconscious, what we might call the vegetative state. But when you actually interrogate the brain and you ask people to do volitional tasks, like imagine in this case playing tennis or walking around your house, they activate areas with a bold signal, an fMRI, that is normal. But volitionally, they're doing it in their head, they're not manifesting behaviors. Before we had this kind of imaging, we presumed these people to be unconscious. Now we know they have covert consciousness. Okay, so that's a problem. Once you know that these people are covertly conscious, there's a whole bunch of ethical responsibilities and obligations that adhere to that state. So technology then comes in and provides some of the early remedies. And in the bottom screen on the left, Martin Monty in a New England Journal paper, uh, the, first, the earlier paper was Adrian Owen in Science, said, okay, let's toggle those responses. Imagine playing tennis, imagine walking around your house to yes, no responses. And someone who was heretofore unable to communicate is now able to communicate using computational neuroscience. And, and, and a related work that we did was deep brain stimulation in the minimally conscious state that allowed somebody who seemed to be unresponsive to be able to communicate. All right, so let me, let me just back up and talk a little bit briefly about disorders of consciousness so you can understand what I just said. So the brain is basically divided into two parts. The, the autonomic part, which is the lower part of the brain, I don't know if you can see the cursor or not, yeah. which is the brain stem down here, and the higher cortical functions. The brain stem is responsible for um, breathing, heart rate, autonomic things you don't have to think about, and it's, it's the vegetative part of the brain. The higher cortical functions are the cortex. And, and, the, and, the, and when you have a brain injury, you, you move from a coma, which is an eyes closed state of unresponsiveness, and then after about a week or two, your brain stem recovers, okay, and you move into the vegetative state, which is the recovery of the lower part of, of the brain, the vegetative part. And, and, um, and, and again, I just want to just show you this earlier imaging here. This is an early neuroimage of, by Vesalius of a skeleton contemplating a skull, which to us looks primitive. And what I'm going to show you today looks, you know, a current, but in two or three hundred years, this will be primitive too. So it's also the march of technology. So, so after you've been in the, in the, in the vegetative state and it persists um, for uh, three months, it, it becomes uh, chronic. Uh, and uh, 12 months after traumatic brain injury. Just recently in 2018, we got rid of the permanent vegetative state. We thought these people, once you hit those milestones, were permanently vegetative. Turns out 20% of them are going to evolve into a higher brain state. So that's another important point. It's the contingency of knowledge that the states, the categories that we create change, and with that, the ethical um, ideas have to change. So the vegetative state was first described in 1972 by Brian Jeanette, a Scottish neurosurgeon, uh, who was also responsible for the Glasgow Coma Scales and all that, and Fred Plum, who was my teacher, who also described the locked-in state. So after the vegetative state and people evolve into a higher state is this next brain state called the minimally conscious state, which is a state in which people appear to be vegetative, but actually have the ability to respond intermittently and episodically to commands and to questions. The problem is because it's episodic and intermittent, you don't always get the behavior, and so people are often mischaracterized as being in the vegetative state when in fact they are conscious, albeit at a liminal level. In fact, a study that was done showed that 41% of people who've had traumatic brain injury in nursing homes who were thought to be in the minimally conscious state actually were, to be in the vegetative state, were actually in the minimally conscious state. Neurologically, and in the brain, and this is where the functional imaging comes in, the, there's a functional difference between a vegetative brain and a minimally conscious brain. 
And, and, the, and the key issue is that the vegetative brain can't engage in functional integration. So this, this top left screen is a study that uh, Stephen Lorries did, and they did nail bed compression, and patients activated the primary sensory area in the cortex, but not the entire pain network. So, so red is the pain network that you see there, and in the lower uh, image there, in the PBS uh, slides, the blue is the absence of inter integration. That contrasts to the minimally conscious state patients where they can actually have extended neural networks that are present, but they're not always activated. And that's why we have the episodic and intermittent uh, responsiveness. This notion of a discordance between what you see at the bedside and what you, you, can, you can query in the brain with functional imaging was first described by Adrian Owen in that 2006 patient. And uh, this was a woman who was clinically in the vegetative state, uh, but with neuroimaging was able to, to uh, play tennis. Uh, she was able to walk around her house and disaggregate linguistically similar words uh, like a riverbed creek and a creek in your neck um, as she would be a normal person. Um, and so um, I described this with my colleague, Dr. Sheff, Nico Sheff at Cornell, as non-behavioral MCS, which shows this discordance. And again, this was the work that led to the New England Journal paper, where they toggled that to the language responses. Again, we have a problem, technology responds to the problem. And it's not just in chronic care patients who have been uh, in, in, in these states for, for months and, and years, but now it's even migrating up into the intensive care unit where patients in the intensive care unit who appear to be unresponsive are actually, um, when they're queried in the, in the scanner, the fMRI machines, they actually have, uh, or EEG is another, is another technology, can have covert consciousness, and these people, it's important clinically. They have better prognoses at one year, and of course, if a family member knows the patient is in there, even though they don't appear to be in there, they're going to be more hopeful and they're going to be more aggressive with the treatment, and the doctors are going to be less likely to prematurely withhold or withdraw life-sustaining therapy. So all of this stuff has kind of coalesced into this bigger notion of what's called cognitive motor dissociation, right? So there's a dissociation between what's going on in your head and what your behavior really manifesting, and it's kind of like a phenotype genotype um, this, this distinction. So remember Mendel's garden with the, the you know the pea plants in 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 in, in, in Czechoslovakia, um, in Bruno, you know, the, and different generations are different colors, but their genetics are different, even though the phenotypes are the same. So if you think about the circuitry in the brain as the sort of the genotype and the behaviors as the phenotype, sometimes they don't always coalesce. So what's the importance of this with respect to rights and patients who have a cognitive motor dissociation, or CMD? Well, it, it's the potential for conscious people to be ignored. How many of you saw the, the play Hamilton? You know, you know how many of you, anybody see the play Hamilton? There's this line, in the room where it happened. Well, you're in the room, but nobody knows that you're there. Right? It's happening all around you, but you're sitting there in this profound isolation. So imagine that. You can hear what's going on potentially. You can feel pain, right, because you have intact networks, but you're invisible to the people around you. And, and it's, it's profound uh, isolation. You have improved prognosis, and, and there's this possibility for human engagement. I wrote this um, op-ed for the New York Times a couple years ago and, uh, about, about brain injury and civil rights. And I think the artist really depicted it. You know, the doctors are huddling. You know, there's the IV poles. There's a silhouette of this patient who is presumably not there. But inside, there's this person that we're trying to query. So you'd think, you'd think, right, that it would be a good thing to identify covert consciousness. Does anybody think it would be a bad thing to identify? Right? No? It's a good idea, right? We can help these people. But then we run into neuroethics and its prohibitory view of neuroethics. So here's the definition of neuroethics that William Sapphire offered at a conference 20 years ago. I'm actually president of the International Neuroethics Society in our meeting in Montreal uh, in November. We're going to celebrate the 20th anniversary of neuroethics that started here in San Francisco. And Bill Sapphire, who was Nixon's speechwriter as well, and was a wordsmith, defined neuroethics this way. The examination of what is right and wrong, good and bad, 
about the treatment of, perfection of, or, underlined by me, unwelcome invasion of and worrisome manipulation of the human brain. The specifics of brain science hits home as research in no other um, organ. So there's a few problems there if you're thinking about intervening in the brain. It's a worrisome or wary neuroethics Concerns about neural integrity, if you do anything to the brain or you receive data from the brain, it's in breach. The risks of enhancement, issues of neural privacy, cognitive liberty, issues that come up a lot in AI. Legal abuses, fear of therapeutics, described as manipulation of the brain. And there's a kind of a negative idealization of neuroscience, which is also something that we see in AI. There's a lot of negative idealization of what you guys do. And, and, and negative rights could leave people behind. You, be, you, know, you may not be able to fit in the scanner if you're Pinocchio. That's the Italian part of the talk, who is a great Italian um, uh, puppet, right? And it's not just what Bill Sapphire said 20 years ago. Right now, in Chile, anybody from Chile? No? Okay, it's a long trip. Chile is modifying their constitution, and they have a provision on neuro rights. Um, and Rafa Yuste has been a proponent of neuro rights in Chile. And they approved in the, in the Chilean Senate last year, and there's going to be a plebiscite, a vote, in September of this, this decision here, this, this language in the Chilean Constitution. Scientific and technological development will be at the service of people and will be carried out with respect for life and physical and mental integrity. The law will regulate the requirements, conditions, and restrictions for its utilization in persons and must especially protect or safeguard cerebral activity as well as the information from it. So the message is clear, and this, this was a book I wrote about, about brain injury, uh, and this is a patient, Maggie Worthen, and her mother, Nancy, who was thought to be vegetated but actually could use an eye-tracking device to communicate. That's a whole other talk for another story, but the message is clear that engaging the needs of patients <clears throat> with disabling neuropsychiatric conditions is sort of done at your own peril. Um, there's a dangerous kind of exceptionalism, and it deprives people of the possibility of the manipulations that could actually help them. Let's turn to how that notion of, of neuroethics relates to CMD, right? How do you know somebody is in CMD? You don't know from the bedside by looking at them. You have to look at their brain. You have to put them in a scanner. You have to extract information from your brain, from the brain. That would be a prohibition under the Chilean framework or Bill Sapphire's unwelcome invasions. It's a violation of the private and neurocognitive liberty because you can't ask these people for consent. You wouldn't know to ask them for consent unless you knew they could answer, right? So you have this horrible tautology. And then that's just you know non-invasive extraction of information from the brain, you get, you get the possibility. What about putting electrodes in someone's brain, right? That would be even more invasive uh, with respect to neural integrity. And that's, that's what we did, and we published this in Nature in 2007. And this was a patient who was in the minimally conscious state, could only communicate sometimes with eye movements, but in a double-blind crossover study with bilateral thalamic interlaminar nuclear stimulation with using electrodes of the type that are used in Parkinson's disease, um, the person had improved cognitive mediated behaviors, could say six or seven word sentences. Uh, he couldn't talk before this. He could tell his mother he loved her. He could go to Old Navy and, and voice a preference for the kind of clothing he wanted his mother to, to buy him. And he could say the first 16 words of the American Pledge of Allegiance. He had improved limb control and he could first eat for the first time in six years and maintain secretions. Um, these improvements correlated with, with the stimulation, and it was the first evidence that DBS could promote recovery from severe TBI um, in, 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 in history. Uh, and this was a partial restoration of his voice. All of that is good, but a lot of this stuff could be prohibited by these really restrictive uh, frameworks. So I think this is a great paper by, by Marcello and Inca. Um, and, and it's really the convergence of AI and clinical neuroscience. And you see a lot of the overlapping issues. Neuroprivacy, how do we extract the information from a patient 
to make a diagnosis, um, and, 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 and then how do you promote agency? So in one way, you protect agency and autonomy by not violating your cognitive liberty and your privacy. On the other hand, if you think of agency and autonomy as an, as an, as an end constraint, not as a side constraint, you promote an agency and autonomy by giving them voice, by letting them talk to you, right? And then there's the risk of discrimination. Um, and, 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 and one of my deep interests is how neuroscience and neuroethics interacts with disability rights and disability law. So you're actually discriminating against people who could be integrated back into society with, with these technologies. And that's what the Americans with Disabilities Act, and if we have international colleagues here, the UN Convention on the Rights with Persons with Disabilities is all about functional integration. And the neurotechnologies and AI and assistive devices can all help people integrate back into society. And we have to appreciate that the negative rights prevent that integration. The positive rights promote that kind of integration, but it comes with the violation of neural integrity, cognitive liberty, and all the prohibitions that we see in Chilean, the Chilean Constitution and Bill Sapphire's original definition of, of, our, of, of, the, of the field. So what we really need is to have a homeostatic balance between negative and positive rights. And if there's one message here that I want you to take home with you, you know, we can talk about specific codes of conduct and the, and the like, but negative rights and isolation is a bad thing. Positive rights could be abusive, and we have to think about them in a relationship. And that relationship comes to capabilities, right? So Martha Nussbaum, brilliant philosopher, <coughs> talks about capabilities that promote human flourishing. That's ultimately what you guys should be doing. It's not to make a buck. It's not to create a new algorithm for some gaming or some, some trivial thing, but the technology that you are at the vanguard of has the potential to meaningfully make a difference in the world and individual lives. It is a sacred trust. It's a responsibility. And you guys all have to become ethicists. If you're a scientist, you need to be an ethicist because you have to be self-regulating. Most people won't understand the black box. You guys work in that box. And since you're the only ones there, you have to regulate it. You have to self-regulate. And being self-regulating means you're a professional. That's the definition of being a professional. So my, my final slide here is, is, the, is this issue of learn from neuroscience, okay? Learn from neuroethics. When you create a new ethics for AI, make it about human flourishing. Think about capabilities. This is the medallion for the 100th anniversary of the Rockefeller University Hospital. And, and um, you, I don't know if it projects here, but in this box, it says, for the, whoops, for the benefit of humanity. For the benefit of humanity. And, and I think there's an instrumentality to AI, to neuroscience, and the idea is to promote human flourishing. So I'll leave you with that, with my acknowledgments here, and a, and a view from New York City, and I will end, and thank you very much. Thanks, Joseph. Uh, next up, we have Francesca. Mm -hmm. Hi, everybody. Uh, good morning. So um, I really loved your talk, and we have a lot to discuss later, I think, <laughs> and to compare. So in my talk, uh, I will uh, give you the AI perspective. So what has happened in AI regarding the ethics issues? Um, I mean, of course, it's not a complete picture. It's my personal picture. Um, so. I'm sure you are familiar with AI, but I would like to first start with uh, identifying the main uh, capabilities, limitations, and then the ethics issues in AI. So if you want to draw a very brief and very oversimplified <laughs> history of AI, uh, you'll see that AI started a long time ago, not just five or 10 years ago, like some people outside AI may think. Um, and it started with many different techniques. 
um, some of them are uh, where at the beginning because there was there were no data available, not a lot of computing power. There were mostly um, algorithms that were coding um, methods to solve uh, problems in an intelligent way, in a rational way, uh, written by researchers, by developers. And those were coded into the machine that then from then on was able to do that, uh, to solve the problem in that way. And then machine learning techniques uh, came about in the 80s. Um, uh, but they were not, uh, they did not have a wide applicability at the beginning because of a preliminary of the, uh, uh, of the methodologies, but also because uh, at the beginning, again, there was not enough data to make them work well or computing power to deal with all the data that was needed. So now, instead, we have the data, we have the computing power, so those methods really came about in the last uh, few years in a very, in a very wide uh, and uh, application uh, uh, scenario. Um, so, and so you see a lot of applications of AI. This is a very incomplete list, but I'm sure you know, in, every, in our everyday life, we, we basically use AI in many of the activities that we do online, uh, when we use a credit card, when you, we take a picture, when we go on social media, you know, everything we do uh, that has to do with technology. Um, however, AI also has some limitations, and some of them are related to the reliability of AI. Uh, some of them are to do with still uh, many techniques being um, in the what we call narrow AI, so being able to solve a specific problem but not being general enough, although this is changing with capabilities that uh, of AI, techniques of AI that can generate content besides interpreting um, and perceiving and interpreting uh, text, uh, videos, uh, images, and so on, also the ability to generate that. Uh, the lack of robustness and adaptability from one domain or another one, uh, the need for a lot of resources, the more we develop uh, techniques, especially in the machine learning area that require a lot of data and a lot of computing power to train um, machines. So this is just a graph showing uh, the growth of uh, um, a number of parameters, which also is uh, related to how much data and how much computing power you need to train an, an AI system. And the left uh, picture is related to the robustness or lack of robustness sometimes of these AI um, systems where you know some images may be misinterpreted just because they have some small uh, number of pixels that are different um, from the original one. Okay, so AI has a lot of capabilities and these support a lot of applications. It still is not done AI, eh? so it's not done because it has a lot of limitations, but it also raises a lot of ethics issues. So let's look at some of them. So first of all, as I said, AI, and specifically machine learning, needs a lot of data to work well. So this immediately raises questions about data, governance and privacy and storage and collection and labeling and uh, um, uh, sharing of data, especially because in many cases, this data is not just generic data, but sometimes it can be personal data. So a lot of questions about how this data is treated. Uh, second one is one of the most uh, important value that we would like to embed into AI, and this is value of fairness. So we don't want uh, AI systems to make decisions or to recommend decisions to a human being that can create discriminations among different groups of people. We don't want them with human beings, and we don't want them with machines, and we don't want them with humans supported by machines. Um, this is again is one value that we would like AI to be aware about and to work and function according to this value, but there can be other values, so the so-called value alignment process that uh, has to do with many different human values that we would like to embed in AI. Um, another issue is the issue of inclusion. Sometimes AI can be used in a way that is uh, uh, not uh, accessible to everybody and not um, done in a way that uh, can support uh, all the ethnicities, all the communities, and so it is not inclusive enough. Uh, inclusion is as a double aspect, inclusion in those that build the AI system that needs 
to, be, to build the, the capabilities of the AI, and then inclusion in the deployment of the AI system and the way the communities, the various communities are uh, treated. Uh, another thing is that uh, some of these AI techniques, especially those that are related to deep learning, machine learning, are kind of opaque in terms of uh, being able to understand how they get to an, the output given the input data. So this is uh, um, an ethics issue in some sense because if you support uh, a doctor or a professional or in some uh, decision-making environment with this AI system that is just a, a box that you don't know uh, how it got to the output given the input, then this person who is going to have to make a decision based on uh, the, the recommendation of the AI system, this person will probably do some, one of those two things, either reject the recommendation of this box because it doesn't understand how it gives the recommendation, uh, which can be bad because maybe the recommendation also is based on huge amounts of data that the person itself cannot really uh, look at it or digest or assimilate or understand, or the other extreme, the person will follow what the machine says without questioning because he cannot question it, cannot understand. So in any case, uh, you get a decision that it, it is not really what we want in terms of uh, being uh, very informed in making a decision, especially in high stake context. Uh, so explainability is also an issue that is very considered. Transparency is important. Transparency is different from explainability. Explainability is a property of the AI system. Transparency is something that you want from those that build the AI system. They want, you want them to be transparent about what they did in the development life cycle to build the AI system. How, how they tested for bias, uh, what threshold they used, what definition of fairness they used. And because if you don't know that, then you may use this AI system in an inappropriate context, just because you don't know what, what has been done in uh, defining you know, the, the, uh, the, uh, that AI system. Accountability, of course, is a very important issue. Who is responsible if the AI system does not uh, make the correct decision, and this is possible because these are statistic-based systems, they are not correct 100% of the time. Social impact, of course, a very fast transformation. We have seen already AI in our society on jobs and uh, everything else. Human and moral agency, AI can uh, be used in a way that manipulates our preferences and nudges us, so are we really in control of our decisions based and supported by this technology in everything we do? Possible misuse of the technology, even if the technology is perfectly fair, explainable, and have all those properties that we said, transparent and so on, then we can use it for good and bad things. Of course, that's an issue. Um, um, environmental impact, I already mentioned, as well as the power imbalance. Not many entities can collect the amount of data that is needed, um, also can label correctly this amount of data, can use it for compute, uh, they have computing power to do it. So AI ethics is a multidisciplinary field. I agree about the silos problem, but, but really uh, we have been working hard with also many other um, disciplines. And this field of study has a very simple, in principle, goal to take the best out of this technology, AI, and uh, avoid the, the, you know, the negative implications. In terms of uh, um, technological tools, you know, is uh, uh, the goal turns out to be how to design and build AI system that are aligned to our principles and values um, when they are deployed in the real world. But it not only focuses on technical solutions, but also non-technical solutions, such as regulations, policies, corporate processes, governance frameworks, standards, best practices, guidelines, so a lot of different uh, complementary methods. So the main AI actors, as I see it, are, of course, academia. They uh, do a lot in terms of educating the next generation of AI um, uh, experts and innovation in research that happens in academia and in companies. Companies that are using or building AI, and there are not many companies at this point that are neither using nor building AI. 
standard, international standard bodies like IEEE, ISO, NIST, and so on, they define the standards uh, that are not mandatory, but they are then picked up by international communities and they define how things are done. Uh, professional and scientific associations like AAAI, IEEE, and many others, um, and policymakers, of course. So I will give you just an example of uh, each one of these actors and what they've been doing around AI ethics. But first, uh, let me tell you that AI ethics has evolved over the years, uh, not many, because AI ethics really picked up when AI started being, not at the beginning of AI, but when AI started being very pervasive in our life. So at the beginning, which was really not very far uh, away, like uh, 2014, 15, at the beginning there was a phase of awareness. People started getting together and trying to understand these issues. We were seeing a system, AI system that would not behave in the way we would have liked, but we did not really identify correctly at the beginning all these issues that I give you a list of. So at the beginning, communities started getting together, also in a very multidisciplinary way, uh, to understand, even identify the issues, and then they said, you know, what, what is that we don't like really and how we want to position ourselves. So the second phase was the phase of principles. Corporations, governments, academia, uh, civil society, multi-stakeholder organization, everybody wrote principles. I'll give you a, a, a flavor of how many people wrote principles. This is a, a picture uh, put together by uh, the Principles AI project uh, by uh, at Harvard in 2019, so now it, it would be much bigger. And this is a picture that shows that for every ray of this uh, thing is one set of principles published by somebody. So you see that everybody published principles in a certain phase. Now we are not in the phase of principles anymore. We have enough of principles. Now we are in the phase of practice. How do we operationalize these principles in all these actors, whether you are educating the next generation, you are building an AI system, you are using it, you are regulating it, you are defining standards, and so on. So um, let's start from companies. That's my environment. I work for IBM Research, and I, I, I chair the internal AI ethics board. So I really work in trying to understand how a large corporation can operationalize these principles. So why, first of all, why should a company care about these AI ethics? Why should they spend time and effort in uh, um, understanding what relevant issues are for the business model of the company and then doing something about it. And here I give you some, some drivers for co different companies and different units in the company. Um, social justice as equity is a very important driver, the company values in general, the reputation of the company, um, the existing or expected regulations, uh, client demands, more and more clients are asking, what are you doing about bias? Are you testing for bias or not? Um, the pre media pressure, of course, as well as differentiators and business opportunities. You know, if you are, show, you can show that you can take care well of these issues, you have a competitive advantage now, at this point in time, compared to other companies that are still behind on that. Um, so this to tell you that uh, 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 some companies may think that when the regulation will come, I will comply, you know, but that's not the only driver and that's not a successful way of handling AI ethics, not even from, from the company bottom, bottom line uh, perspective. So we did a study some time ago to see where, uh, I mean, last year, to see what companies were doing. We asked many different companies all around the world uh, more than a thousand uh, uh, executives and developers in companies say, what are you doing around AI ethics, around the various issues of AI ethics? And we discover something that are good things and some other not very good. So this is the less good thing, but it's predictable. And this, we call it the intention action gap. So the blue line at the top is uh, the percentage of companies, of the one that interviewed, uh, that said we have endorsed some principles around accountability, transparency, explainability, and so on. So you see, more than half of the company endorsed principles, but less, much less companies really operationalize this principle into their operations. You know, so that's the green line at the bottom. So there is still a lot of 
you know, to be done, which is understandable because, of course, operationalize takes more time and therefore than just endorsing. Uh, but the good news here is uh, from that study is that uh, at least companies, and we did the comparison between another previous study done three years ago, that companies understand that these issues, uh, responsibility of these issues inside the company is, does not belong only to the technical part of the company, but is the board and CEO and for the whole governance level. So here you see what happens between 2018 and 2021 study. All the non-technical leaders' responsibility went up and all the technical leader responsibility went down. So it's my view, it's a good thing that companies over the three years understood that these are issues that will, should be dealt by a company-wide framework and not just by the technical part, by the CTO or technical part of the company. So to give you an idea of what we did at IBM, we started like everybody else with principles, you know, three principles. Uh, we call it principles of trust and transparency. The purpose of AI is to augment the human intelligence. Data belongs to their creator. Technology should be transparent and explainable. Okay, very clear principles, but not operationalized. You know, not, if you give these three principles to your developers, what do they do with it? Nothing. So then we said, okay, what do we mean by trust in AI? What do we mean by trustworthy AI? And we decided to structure this into five buckets which are these five pillars of trustworthy AI, which is explainability, fairness, robustness, transparency, and privacy. So everything we do, because these are the ones that are most relevant to our business model, everything we do is into those, those pillars and the interrelationship uh, between them. Then we said we need a governance structure. So we built a centralized governance structure for the whole of the company that defines the best practices, defines the guidelines, defines the risk assessment processes, and is the AI ethics board is called, now called the tech ethics board because it goes beyond AI. Uh, and we positioned it in a way, in this structure of governance of the company, uh, in a way that it has decision power when the board says that this offering cannot go out to that client because it is, it's not compliant to our principles, it does not go out. So it has decision power. And it's also well connected to the, 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 the business units with other people, focal points, advocacy network, and so on, that connects to the uh, activities in the business units. And it has representatives on the board for all the business units. So it's very tempting for a technology company to say, there is a technology issue, I solve it with more technology. So I build a tool to solve that issue. So, and in fact, that's what we did at the beginning. We built tools, AI Fact Sheet 360, that's for transparency, AI Explainability 360, AI Fairness 360. So for each one of the issues, we built a tool that is open source, everybody can use, to address that issue, understand it better, and have algorithms that address it uh, and uh, test, uh, you know, play around and so on. But actually, very soon we realized that the tools are not definitely are just the easy part, probably. Uh, but you need to educate people that have to use those issues. You have to give them a playbook to tell them how to use these tools inside their existing processes. You have to help them adopt that playbook in a way that is integrated as possible with the current processes that they were already used to. Um, you have to build governance around these additional processes that uh, allow these people to use the tools and to be comply and to check for compliance. Uh, you have to, again, train people and uh, change their frame of mind in understanding the issue and in consulting with clients and other stakeholders, uh, with design thinking sessions and many others. And you have to try to make the team as diverse as possible. That's already a very good first step in making people understand what, what are the different perspectives. Uh, we also built a use case review process. Every offering that goes out, as I said, goes through this review process where we uh, analyze the risk of going out, whether it's compliant to the principles, and then we decide whether it can go out as it is or not, or it can go out but with additional constraints in the contractual agreement. We also have a lot of partnerships a very multidisciplinary with academia, with policymakers, with professional associations, with multi-stakeholder associations. So let me go fast because of the lack of time, but uh, here I wanted to tell you that AI research uh, environments are doing a lot in terms of uh, um, research 
um, content uh, on value alignment, fairness, explainability, and so on. AI for good initiatives, like the very recent Kai um, 2022 AI for good track. Um, uh, uh, specific conferences like the AIS and the FACT conference on uh, research, doing research to um, address the issues that I mentioned, uh, and then even some uh, mandatory sections in papers that are submitted to, co to AI conferences to uh, address, and, and more than address, think about the co possible ethical considerations of what uh, the authors are putting together in that paper. Um, there are a lot of AI ethics education courses. Here is just uh, 16 of them uh, that uh, were collected by, uh, by this article that appeared in 2021, but there are more than 100 all over um, US and other places um, on uh, uh, AI ethics. And these, these are uh, often multidisciplinary. They engage with uh, uh, teachers from different disciplines, not just AI. Uh, there are a lot. Of, there is a lot of work, uh, as I mentioned, international standards. This is the way IEEE has addressed it by doing the so-called P7000 series of standard working groups that includes 15 working groups for developing standards around AI ethics, uh, as well as this book that is called the Ethically Aligned Design that is specifically intended for the uh, community that uh, IEEE refers to. Um, and then there are regulations. I'll give you the example of the EU, European Union AI Act that is under discussion at the moment and when it will be approved by the, AI, by the uh, EU Parliament will be in effect all, in all the 26 countries of the uh, European Union. Uh, and this is a very important first step with, of a very comprehensive approach. Uh, I'm mentioning this because it's a very w wide scope uh, compared to what happens in the US where every city or every state can have its own, uh, like New York State, for example, will have one in effect uh, at the 1st of January. Um, yes. Uh, and, uh, but here I want to mention three things that are important here. First, that it employs a risk-based approach, meaning that the EU wants to regulate more uh, applications of AI that are more risky, according to some definition of risk. Um, second, it wa does not want to regulate AI technology, per se, but applications of the AI technology. So that's a very important uh, 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 ingredient in that uh, regulation proposal. And then when there is risk for the AI application, high enough risk, then they focus on the definition of trustworthy AI with all the, the topics that I mentioned earlier um, to be used, to be the only AI that should be used in high risk application with a lot of uh, obligations for providers and for users of the AI application. So let me finish with, uh, again, uh, the, uh, like what just started with, so the convergence and synergies between different uh, um, technologies, for example, AI and neuroscience and neurotechnologies. Um, of course, the convergence brings additional issues to the, to, to, to the table, uh, like mental privacy, human agency, human identity, and many others that were mentioned in the previous talk. Um, uh, I, I think that AI can learn a lot from uh, what neuroscience and neurotechnologists have been considering in terms of uh, ethics issues and how to handle that. But also the other directions is true because uh, in AI, um, we had to be very fast in operationalizing the principles. And this is because we were forced to do that because the applications came about very fast in the last like 10 years. Uh, so that forced the whole community to understand what to do about it. So uh, that's why we wrote these two articles. Uh, one will be, is published already on Neuron and the other one in the communication of ACM for the two communities, AI and, and neuroscientists to say, yes, we, we come from two different stories, from different paths, um, but we can all learn from each other. You know, we had to operationalize very fast and we had to be from reactive to proactive in addressing these issues. Um, on the other hand, we can learn from neuroscientists from another point of view because they are much more used and for a long time about ethics issues in research and also in some applications. 
So let me thank you, everybody, and uh, you can go here you know, and find the IBM AI ethics uh, approach. Thank you. Okay, so now we're going to um, have a bit of a discussion. Um, and so your talks were really interesting, and I have a bunch of questions, um, some of which are pre-prepared, some of which I like came up with on the spot looking at your at your talks because I have so many questions, basically. Um, uh, so, I mean, I guess one of the first sets of questions involves uh, codes of conduct and codes of ethics, right? So. Um, if you look at like the AAAI code of conduct, right, it discusses things like minimizing and justified harms or enhanced responsibilities of leaders in the field. Um, SFN, on the other hand, has a code of ethics that discusses misconduct, plagiarism, and harassment, um, and not much about bioethics pr principles. Um, and so there's a line of questioning about how the different codes of conduct uh, come about. Um, and whether you think this is, um, wh how you think people here should be thinking about uh, codes of ethics and codes of conduct as they go to develop them. And then lastly, like if CCN should have a code of conduct or code of ethics, which was a surprise to me that it did not exist. Okay, I can start. Um, is it out? Yeah. Yes, so, um, yeah, so AAAI, um, I think has done a good job in terms of uh, code of conduct for the behavior of people involved in the, co in, in the conference. So we have three code of conduct, one for authors, one for reviewers, and one for participants at the conference. Uh, we also have some, what you read, you know, some, something uh, about uh, um, what AI should be about and what the mission of the AAAI Association and the conference is about, you know, developing AI research for positive um, impact. Uh, but we, we, we didn't go uh, far enough uh, to actually, as I, as I mentioned, operationalize these, uh, um, these uh, uh, guidelines in terms of what is good to do in research and what is not good to do. Um, we ask authors to uh, think about the ethical consequences of what they are putting together, even if it's just a theoretical paper, even if it's not a, a deployed uh, application. Um, some other conferences like EJKAI are having a lightweight uh, um, content check on the content of the papers, like for example, the images that they use, the appearance of some avatar, um, or you know that is not considered inclusive enough, or diverse enough, or something. So uh, there are the reviewers are asked to check and to identify and raise their hand, as saying, oh, maybe this paper doesn't have, uh, you know, that is not diverse or inclusive enough and so on. So, but we're still, I, I still see that as still as a work in progress in operationalizing that, those guidelines. So I think guidelines are important, but I think they can often be platitudes. And, and sometimes you go, of course, I would never do that, I never do that, you know, and then you, you know, and they're so abstract that they don't speak to the reality. So I think I think one of the one of the you know one of the d debates in bioethics is the difference between principalism and a more so where where you have your principles and it's top down, versus a kind of a more inductive kind of reasoning where it's bottom up. And so I think to go along with these principles, are ca there should be case vignettes that people can process and think through the issues because. Because generally, you know, you, when you have, you, you might agree with the principles, but what happens when the principles conflict? And, and I think that that is, that that is the process we call an ethics balancing and specification of principles. And, and so I think they need to be a little more robust. The other thing is, you know, you had in your slide, you know, like we're, we're, we're now in the practice phase, we're beyond the principles phase. I think given the rush and the scope of the pace of this history, um, I think we should, we should make sure that, that the theory and the practice are, are as you just said, in conversation, um, on, ongoing, because it's going so fast. We would hate to put in an implicit bias that we thought was okay now, and then realize in 10 years, oh my God, we were, we were fostering some kind of structural inequity or racism or something because we didn't, we didn't understand it then. So 
I think it needs to be an ongoing discussion. There's a wonderful book by a guy named Donald Shin who uh, wrote a book called the, the Reflective Practitioner. And it was an MIT press book from the, from the 80s, I guess. And he was talking about the relationship between theory and practice and how practitioners think in action. Um, it's different how theoreticians think in action, and it's different how you know, people who just work think, do, do activities. So it has to be iterative. As you're doing this work and you come up with problems, that's where, where the rubber hits the road and we need to have this as a kind of a, you know, iteration of this. I, I think if we prematurely lock in on principles, the technology will leapfrog the principles or we won't understand the principles. I think the key is to understand what the, what the, what the intent was and, and not, to get, not to sort of latch on to an abstraction that really does become a platitude. I think principles are important, but they can be sometimes over-restrictive uh, or too vague to be really meaningful. Yeah, so kind, kind of in line with that, one of the things that I saw in your talk that I really liked, so one of the most influential, I do a lot of diversity, equity, and inclusion work. Um, one of the most influential articles that I was sent was an article about like good intent and why having good intent put in a code of conduct can actually be really bad for underrepresented people. Yeah. And it was the, basically it made the statement, like you said in your talk, right, where a positive rule is still a rule, right? And to some degree, we're telling people, particularly less empowered people, that we intend to hold them to having good intent, regardless of how badly they're harmed. Um, and we're potentially like not going to create a safe space for them, or they feel like we're potentially not gonna create a safe I, space I, for I, them. I'd just say that one of the ways to remedy that is to have a more expansive view of the voices that are participating, not just neuroscientists, but you know, we have institutional, you've all had institutional review board for your experiments. There's, there's, a, rep, there's a need for community representation. It's in the, in the National Research Act of 1974. So I think we need to bring communities, different kinds of communities, people with disabilities, people who have neuropsychiatric diseases, regular citizens, um, a diversity of the population, because what we're constructing here is, is, is a kind of a recipe for how we're gonna be, how democracy is gonna interact with each other, or how we're gonna interact with each other. We now interact with each other through this, this technology in ways that, you know, de Tocqueville, you know, who wrote about, you know, democracy in America in the 1830s, he toured America. It's a different country now because of the technology. So this has to be a conversation that involves everybody, not just people who come to this kind of conference. This is like, you know, the nerd 2.0. I love that, that nerd language there. This is nerd 2.0, but, but there are people who weren't the nerds. Everybody needs to be involved. And when you think about the fractures in society right now, and the skepticism that people might have of technology or people who do academic work or, or big corporations, this has to be a much more inclusive conversation. That's great. Okay, so my second set of questions is about um, what is the CCN community's responsibility for getting involved in ethical discussions um, in neuroscience, cognitive science, and AI? Um, uh, what's the, re the responsibility to interact with the private sector? Um, do you have advice for doing this? And then I guess part of something that's an issue in my life is like act, activism, the word activism in science, right? So activism is often used in where I am as a dirty word, right? It's used to say, oh, you feel too passionately about this issue, and so we'll just scientifically dismiss the kinds of things that you're saying. Um, and I feel like that often comes up in the ethics space. Um, and so how might you think about like advocacy in science, Francesca? Sure. Um... Yes, so um, I, I think that um, uh, I would focus on really multidisciplinary engagements. So for example, um, um, several years ago, already uh, in 2016, we built this um, organization, nonprofit organization called the Partnership on AI that was started by six companies, including Google, including IBM and Apple, you know, Facebook, then Facebook. Um, Amazon, so but now has a hundred partners, where twenty of them are companies, and everybody else is academia, civil society organization like ACLU and many others, and advocacy groups. So that, to me, is uh, an example of an environment um, where advocacy and uh, multidisciplinary thinking and rethinking, probably, as you said, you know, about principles, guidelines, and also how to rationalize them, is a good environment. Uh, and of course, one uh, 
it doesn't come natural to come and speak with these other stakeholders that uh, use a different terminology, use a different language, have different drivers, have different perspectives. So you need to start with time being educated about what it means to get to be to take the best out of this environment where you sit at the same table with uh, uh, even competitors if you are a company, and even uh, antagonists, uh, like, uh, I don't know, a company uh, that ACLU has just sued, or something like that, you know. So, so it needs uh, um, training, and it needs, uh, you know, in, in, intentionally to, the, to do that, but I think that's the, the place, uh, in my view, to bring up advocacy, and, uh, and to have good, you know, uh, overall results uh, at the end. Uh, rather than inside a single company or inside a single a civil society organization or in academia in silos. I totally agree with that. Brilliant. Um, you know, I think we're having really important conversations now in America and around the world after George Floyd's murder about DEI, but it's DEI pre-AI, right? We're not thinking about, we need to add those letters to that, to that acronym because um, it's, it's of a different era. We're not thinking about the digital divide quite as much as we're thinking about other important aspects of DEI. One, one article which just came out, you know, the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine has a kind of a, 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 a magazine called Issues in Science and Technology. I don't know if any of you guys have seen it. It's a wonderful magazine. And they have, they have an article this month. It's called Curb Cuts for Science. Um, and they're talking about how curb cuts made, made um, you know, the world accessible for people who were in wheelchairs and with disabilities. And they're talking about how do we expand, how do we bring um, um, accessibility to science? It's not AI specifically, but to science uh, for people with disabilities. Um, and, and I think that it's a good article to just have a look at because there are lots of things there that are, that are, that are applicable to, to uh, the AI conversations we're having now about advocacy. Awesome, okay, and so my, my final set of questions before we open it up to the audience. Um, so you both talked a lot about regulation, right? And that is certainly something that I've thought about um, at Google a lot. Um, and you know, at, to some degree, I have felt through sort of like watching the dissolution of the ethical AI group um, at Google, like okay, I'm frustrated and I don't feel like this is gonna be properly handled internally. Um, we'll have external regulation come in and maybe that will impact on it. Um, and maybe it will. And then I end up thinking, you know, one of the, one of the, one of my problems might be that I'm just thinking by the time regulation comes in, like 10 years down the line, like it'll be a different world and maybe I'm not fully taking that into account. Um, and then also thinking about, um, we talked about different ways to have process around AI ethics in different environments. And just the concern also that regulation is gonna bring in this structure which doesn't allow you, as you were talking about before, to really just like think about what you're doing. It's just going to like be a bunch of words almost that we have to follow and how to avoid that. Um, and I think about that as like somebody who's written a code of conduct, right? Um, and then had sort of like legal forces come in and seeing that process happen. Um, yes, uh, uh, first I think that I don't think that a company or any other entity should see regulation in a passive way. They say, oh, uh, regulation is coming and I have to comply. I think that, you know, and we, we for example, at IBM, we spend a lot of with policymakers to make them understand what the real issues are, what the tech, and also the capabilities of AI and the current state of AI. Um, so that there are many um, ethics, uh, con there are many concerns around AI, uh, but in some sense, and there have been articles recently about that, the AI community is kind of, uh, kind of divided into two fronts, you know, those that care about the current issues with AI, the fairness, uh, the, the, the explainability, and so on, and those that care about this value alignment, control, off switch, uh, you know, about the singularity and the uh, super intelligence. So, uh, where should regulator go? What should regulator try to address? Which concerns, which, uh, which issues? Um, that's something that happens before the regulations comes out and it requires uh, the uh, knowledge-based and fact-based uh, information from the people that are building the AI system. So in a proactive way rather than a, a passive way. But also, again, regulation 
should be seen as uh, uh, something that uh, codifies something that should be there already. So in some sense, uh, um, we see this EU, European regulation that will not be here in 10 years, but it will be here probably in two years or three years or something. Um, as uh, a way to uh, uh, codify, uh, maybe in a more you know, uh, strict way, uh, what companies should already put in place, uh, like the risk assessment process that we have at IBM that works uh, all over the world, wherever IBM has an office, um, it doesn't require a regulation to, to then comply to that regulation. It works independently of the regulation. So in my view, having uh, um, so the goal also of uh, the relationship of a global company with regulators is again proactive, but it's also that the, the, a global company can bring that regulation also in places where the regulation does not apply. Because of course a global company doesn't want to use a different risk assessment in every different country. So it will go and use uh, probably the same risk assessment, the same uh, processes all over the place. And so that will bring things that are defined for one country also in a, in a much broader scope, scope and a re region of the world. You know, I, I, I've been teaching up at Yale Law School as a doctor for like the last eight years. And one of the things that, that I've, I've really come to understand is that, that there really are two different universes. And the law is meant to have what's called stare decisis. It's the stability of the law. If the law changed all the time, we'd have chaos. But the law by its nature is conservative. And if you think about originalism as a, as a legal structure, and you talk about illegal search and seizure, which was the Fourth Amendment, the idea that the British couldn't go into your drawer, in your desk, in your house, and take out documents that were important to you, how do you extrapolate that to you know, what's on your computer or what's in your head if we're extracting information? And, and, and Francesca had a really, she touched briefly about, um, about physician responsibility. Just think about malpractice law. Right, which is not constitutional, it's tort law. And, and I've been thinking a lot about how does a doctor who should be responsible for what we do to our patients and the, diagno the integrity of the diagnosis and the treatment, how can we be responsible if we don't understand the mechanism by which a slide is being looked at in a pathology lab or a mammogram where the AI is, really has, has advanced a lot? And how do we, how do we write um, a tort law that, 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 that that envisions some kind of notion of co-responsibility. You don't want the physician to no longer be responsible for their patient because that, that undermines the sense of being a fiduciary agent for your, for your patient. It would undermine the trust in the doctor-patient relationship. My, my meta point here is, is that malpractice law, notions of responsibility have to evolve to the technology. Um, and, and so we really need to have the con kind of conversation you're talking about where, where you know, the people who do this work and, the, and the, you know, the, the AI designer may be as important as the physician in malpractice law as we eventually you know, um, develop new ways of enhancing, again for human good, how we look at slides, how we look at mammograms and the like. But I think the conversation needs to you know, be very um, robust and we're not nearly doing enough because the law the way it's currently uh, written uh, doesn't accommodate this, this really uh, uh, disruptive and, in a good way, technology. Awesome, thanks. Um, okay, so it's time, I think, for audience questions. So um, if anybody has a question, I think there's a microphone over there. Yes, uh, or there. Hi, I really thank you for this uh, conversation and this discussion. This is really awesome. Um, I come from the cognitive neuroscience side of things, and one of the things that's been a boon is the advent of large data sets, and this has been great for reliability, replicability, accessibility, all of these great things. But one of the things that I think about and I worry about is um, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, these data are still floating out there. What can we do with the technology then that we can't do now? How do we protect the rights of human subjects um, and how do we get them to give per, um, informed consent when they don't know what, how this might be used some decades in the future? Thank you. Yeah, so that, that question has already come up with like biobanking, you know, for biological specimens. And 
So, you know, I think now when we write the consent documents, we put in some of the contingencies that might happen, and, and we ask people prospectively, would you agree to have it? It's very hard, as you, you know, in, imply, it's hard to recontact people for consent later on because they die, they disappear, or you can't reach them. So I think it's, 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 it's thinking about it in a preventative way, but at the same time, there have to be some sense of what the limits would be. Um, but I think if we look at, at what biobanking has done, it's probably an analogous uh, regulatory structure for, for large data sets. And, and you know, again, the computational stuff has made de-identification sort of impossible. Um, just as, as well as with, with biological samples, because now we have we can we can identify you based on your genome, of, you know, pretty much. So, so the confidentiality issue also becomes a, a tremendous risk, and 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 in the conf the context of of uh, uh, biobanking uh, and biological samples, and also an extended mind sort of thing, you know, now there would be implications for people who are related to you either biologically or in a social network. So, so we have to think about it as a community issue well. It's not only your data, but it may be people who were like you who lived in a neighborhood or, or had certain characteristics and the like. So it's a great question, but I think we can learn a little bit by analogy with biobanking, but again, there are limits to analogic reasoning. Good question. Uh, another European uh effort that uh, tried to address that thing already a few years ago is the General Data Protection Regulation, which um, addressed the issue of who is generating the data, who is uh, controlling the data, who is using the data, and the various you know, rights for the people that uh, generate the data themselves. So the, the data subjects, uh, they're called. Um, I'm not sure that, uh, so that law was very influential, I think, in thinking about those issues. Uh, I'm not sure that it really um, was 100% successful in uh, achieving the goals that they had in mind, but definitely was a good uh, point of discussion. Um, related to your question, it just came to mind that a um, few weeks ago, I was listening to some uh, summary of some, uh, I was, I am on a board of, of a, research center and they were giving you know the summary of uh, you know the last year whatever work that they have been doing and in one of the projects they were using data from um, disease people from many many years ago and they were showing on the slides they were presenting they were showing the names that all the data the table with all the names of these people and they say why are you showing me this personal data to everybody, and they say, oh, they're deceased. And so <laughs> they didn't really understand that there would be, you know, some ethics issue in sharing things, even if people cannot say anything, you know, or complain, you know. So, um, so definitely there is a lot of education to be done uh, in, in the research community at least, uh, but then, and then regulation also in the, uh, because they said, oh, that, that's legal, we check, that's legal. Well, okay, but the, still, why do you need to do that? If it's not needed, why do you need to show me that personal data? So there is a lot of education uh, and, and regulation maybe to, ca to catch up on that. You know, human, human subjects research do have different rules for people once they're deceased, so you know, th 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 that's a problem. But I, what your question suggests that, that data sets live forever, right? Even if people who are in them have died. And yeah. so I think one of the things that just an idea that came to mind is if we think about a database as an ongoing clinical trial, as a repository of data, we might be able to think about using data safety monitoring boards that are comprised, as, 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 as you said, with you know, broad groups of people to regulate them you know, and how the data is used in a, in a representative way, in a deliberative democracy kind of way. 30 years from now, there'll be a DSMB that'll look at the data set that includes all of us and we're not there anymore. Um, and so I think the, not only the principles about regulations, but processes that, that instantiate those principles is also something we have to think about as a way to have a way to safeguard, you know, prospectively what we can't do, you know, now forever. Another thing that generated a lot of discussion and I think also processes was the so-called the right to be forgotten. Right. Uh, where people said, I don't want 
to be present, uh, to be you know, showing up in this website with this data, that something that I did, I don't know, many years ago. And, uh, and of course, it's not an easy thing to do, uh, technically, no? because maybe you use the data explicitly, but or maybe you use it to train an AI system, and then uh, the AI system is behaving not using explicitly that data anymore, but with weights over the parameter of a neural net that were also dependent on that data. So how do you really eliminate that? So that's an important issue that uh, also generated a lot of work. Hi, thank you very much for, for the discussion so far in your talks. I think what it illustrated to me is that there's a certain divide. There's a divide between the academic clinical driven research where you do neurotechnology, you go into the brain, uh, you stick electrodes in, so you have to go into a very uh, let's more, a severe level of, of ethical review. And then on the other side, you have the consumer end where technology is coming, are, are coming mainly less from an academic context, from a corporate context, and have to basically operate at a completely different scale. And, and I think we, we saw this dichotomy beautifully. I think what's interesting here about CCN is that ultimately it's people who look not at the hardware so much as the software that runs in our brain. So uh, in terms of the representations and algorithms that we have. And so we have a challenge here because the technologies themselves that would come out of our work are not necessarily clinical or medical ethics style technologies. They're more technologies that can influence, shape, uh, manipulate uh, uh, human thought and, and human decision making. And so it seems to me that we're on the much faster moving track, more on the AI side in some ways. Uh, and if you think about you know, metaverses where I can observe what you're doing, can control what you're seeing, I can systematically and slowly extract all sorts of information about you. What insights do you have for us as a community about how to think about regulating or, or, or at least guidelining how we shape our work about the human decision-making process and how we can influence it. So I, I made a passing comment at the beginning of my talk about you know, private and, 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 and public and extended minds. I really think that dichotomy that you make is very important, but if we learned anything in the pandemic, right, is that public health ethics may be more important than, than the dyadic relation between a doctor and a patient. Right, so I think that, that seeing this as a public health issue, how we think, right, how, how we process information as communities is very analogous to public health. And I think that, that that's, that's one way of thinking about it, right, that there are consequences for groups of people um, would, be, would, be, would be useful. Um, so, uh, you know, I, 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 and I think that, that this also relates to other things outside of health, like education how minds are shaped, um, you know, at the beginning using AI and education. I mean, childhood education and how people, how, how people develop is, is, has the potential for being transformed. And I think actually what you guys do in the non-medical side of things is probably going to be more consequential for human society and civilization than what's happening in the medical sphere. But the regulatory space is much less robust on that public health side. Um, and we saw how that, that sort of neglect, as it were, during the pandemic had, had really dire consequences. Well, um, um, yeah, I agree with what you said, and I agree that there is this challenge of this uh, um, um, double you know, um, setting, which is the mani possible manipulation of single individuals in this relationship with the technology, um, and then the transformation of the society as a whole. And the two are related, but it's not very explicit or always, uh, it's not very always clear to understand how one you know, generates the other one. And that's the challenge um, to really understand how to avoid the transformation of society that are not aligned with our vision of the future, of the future society. Um, so, uh, so I mean, th th there are you know interesting uh, uh, and challenging uh, questions that I think that not only CCN but you know every, as you said, you know CCN is more similar to AI in the sense of, of in AI we have robotics of course but also devices but we are not 
most of AI is not specific to hardware, does not need devices or specific AI devices you know, to be de deployed. So I agree that there is a similarity there to be exploited. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Dave Radish, University of Minnesota. Um, Dr. Finns brings up this really interesting point of that the law is historically very conservative and there are reasons for that. But um, over the last 20, 40, 50, 100 years, we've learned a lot about how human cognition works. And the law's theory on cognition, and in fact, I would argue a lot of the ethics kind of philosophy of, cog of cognition is, to put it bluntly, based on things that are several thousand years out of date. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about, have you thought of how what we currently know about cognition and things like multiple decision systems and things like that, and you gave the example of um, the fact that we can now open up vegetative states. Um, how does that change that fundamental legal and in fact ethical structure? Are we still building based on old ethical and legal models that may be outdated? It's a great question, and, and that's why I'm a pragmatist um, and not an essentialist. Because you know, John Dewey was interesting in merging science with with normative thinking, and 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 it's an evolving thing. Um, and I agree with that. One one of the one of the areas that where we see that question being brought up is whether or not neuroscience can be, be more predictive than juries in in criminal responsibility and cr in criminal law. It turns out juries are better than the current state of any kind of functional imaging. And a lot of the neuroimaging that got into the courtroom is still kind of in the voodoo stage. Um, but that's 10 years from now, that's not gonna May be not be, but so I think we have to anticipate that. And then, and then you know, trial by jury, which is a, you know, a hallmark of democracy, um, is it gonna be trial by Hal and his friends? I mean, how does that work? And so you're absolutely right. And, 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 and you know, there's a conservatism, like, Think about the abortion decisions recently, and Dobbs, uh, originalism, or or the notion of of you know gun control and the right to bear arms. They, the, the Constitution did not envision you know assault weapons. They 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 envision muskets against the British. Um, so I think we have to really have a, a really good dialogue um, where scientists and 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 other kinds of clinicians talk with our legal colleagues to say, okay, these are real problems and we have to, we have to you know, revivify the law to adapt to the changing technologies. And it, you know, because again, this, this notion, I used the word analogy before, the, the, the limits of analogic reasoning um, you know, become really apparent in periods of transformational change. Um, and you, you, know, you tr and it, it's, it's almost like you know, the Thomas Kuhn argument the structures of scientific revolution, and he wrote about, you know, how they had you know they had Newtonian physics. They were kind of brushing up against relativistic physics, and they're trying to tinker with Newtonian physics to make it work at the speed of light, and it didn't work. And they eventually had to create another, you know, sort of domain in physics. And I think the law has to have a new domain to address all the technological innovation that we're talking about. Um, and, 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 uh, and, and at the same time, we have to think fast and slow, as it were. Yeah. I, I would point out what I mean, the, the issue I think is it's a lot more than the technological innovation, it's actually the scientific understanding of human cognition. Right. That's why and I said thinking fast and slow and right, everything right, else, right. Right, and but you go ahead. Please. Yeah, so uh, I think that uh, regulation, even the most advanced regulation, uh, still thinks technology as something separate from a, the human being. Right. Yes, yeah, supporting, uh, working, you know, and sometimes it requires human oversight, but doesn't say exactly what it means, on the loop, in the loop, or whatever, but still thinks technology as separate. And so that uh, does not allow to see the um, relationship between the technology and human cognition uh, in one direction, and also in the other direction. Uh, the fact that we know more about human cognition, co cognition can be used uh, even in a positive way, but can also be used in a negative way. For example, I think that most of the apps that we use every minute of our day um, try to stimulate mostly our 
thinking fast. They don't want us to reason. They don't want us to pause. They don't want us to reflect. You know? Dopamine. Uh, and so, so is regulation aware of that? And uh, does it facilitate or supports or drives technology to also stimulate our thinking slow? Uh, which could be something that can be useful or positive for the future society, the way we interact. Because we, if we only think with our thinking fast, we, we are not willing to compromise, we are not willing to reason and to revise our beliefs because that would be thinking slow. We're not used to that anymore. So the interaction between cognition and technology is still something that regulations uh, is not really picking up. But I think it's it's an evolution. Thank you. I just want to point out, thinking fast and slow is 60 years out of date. We are way beyond that. <laughs> okay. Yes. Hi, um, Tal Golan, Columbia University. So I have a question about AI transparency. Um, we have this new emerging class of AI systems that are intentionally put into black boxes and served to the public through limited APIs. The most prominent examples are GPT-3 and DALI-2. So my question is whether this is a legitimate business decision, that this is corporate IP, um, or is there an ethical problem here, a transparency problem? Because the research community cannot look into the data, code, and parameters of these systems. Yeah, so I definitely think that uh, there are um, um, expanded or additional ethics issues uh, to consider when we, we, we use these large language models, um, um, especially if the intention is to use it in high stake decision environments where the decision can be you know, impactful, significantly impactful on people and, and society. So, um, I agree with you that yes, yes, uh, and I think I, I've seen already um, initiatives coming up uh, uh, in, in also in a multidisciplinary way that try to understand what are the additional issues uh, before deploying. Another thing is that uh, um, I've seen large language models um, released uh, with uh, licenses that uh, forbid certain usage of the model for like, I don't, I don't know, like the Bloom model, for example, uh, which is an open source large language model has been released with a responsible AI license that uh, uh, makes the software, makes the model open, meaning that everybody can use it for uh, commercial, non-commercial research and so on, but with, uh, uh, I think, eight, eight or nine uh, usages that are restricted. So that's one approach, uh, but there are many others that should be investigated. So we've raised a lot of super important, interesting ideas here. Um, can you hear me fine? Yes, okay, great. Um, and there's been lots of talk about the right ways 